read uh, in a couple places. Take our text. Our main text is going to be Isaiah, book of Isaiah, chapter number 6. But I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles this morning, chapter 26. Second Chronicles 26, because we're going to be reading a good part there, and I would ask you, as, as always, keep your Bible open, we're going to be looking through here some verses. Um, Sunday School, I want, to, I want to invite you out, we've been looking at uh, some prophecy, looking at the book of Daniel, and I uh, hope it's been a help to the folks who are there, it seemed like folks have enjoyed that, we're looking at... Uh, um, the prophecies of Daniel. We've looked at the image of Nebuchadnezzar and how that correlates with uh, ancient history, the kingdoms of the world, and that uh, that we see there. And then not just that, but how it's going to relate to the coming Antichrist, who will be coming in in, in coming days. So I hope it'll be help to you uh, there as well. But I want to read Isaiah chapter six. I'm going to read verse number one. And then we're going to go back to chapter 26 of 1 Chronicles and look at uh, some verses here. So Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 1, the Bible says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Lord, I pray that you'd bless our time here this morning. I pray, God, that you'd help it to be a, uh, a blessing to your people. Lord, I know that we seem to be a little few in number this morning and folks out and whatnot. And I know we have some sickness. I know there are folks who are just unable to be here. Um, Lord, I pray that you'd work on the hearts of our people. Lord, we're living in, in troublesome times, strange days. And uh, Lord, we sure need your help. We need your blessing. Lord this morning so I pray that you be glorified in all that's done and in Jesus name I pray Amen I want to look at this passage here this morning in Isaiah chapter number 6 the Bible tells now I want you, we're, going to, we're going to turn to St. Chronicle in just a moment the Bible tells us here that a very a very important phrase well, something happened, and then after that happened, something else happened. It tells us in chapter 6 of Isaiah, in verse number 1, that the king of Israel died. It was in that same year that the king of Israel died <clears throat> that something else happened. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But we usually read Isaiah 6... We concentrate on the vision of Isaiah and we look at what took place when he sees God's uh, throne in heaven. He sees the images of the seraphim, the cry of the holy, 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 and the, the images that go on in heaven. He sees the holiness of God as it were. We concentrate on these verses and rightfully so. But what I want to do is I want to stop a moment and I want us to go to chapter 26 of first of Second Chronicles because we've got to get the backstory to this chapter. While we hear this chapter mentioned and while it's used for for uh, holiness and consecration and missions, all those for which is true, we've got to get the backstory first. So I want you to turn with me to the book of Second Chronicles. We're going to look at chapter number 26. <coughs> <clears throat> you know, excuse me, I, some of the medicine that I take <clears throat> makes it almost impossible for me to clear my throat. And it is very much a hindrance at times. So uh, we want to beg your patience there. Something happened in Isaiah's life that shook him to the core. Something happened that shook his entire being. And I'm going to say this, that Isaiah's world nationally was turned upside down. 
But to understand how it was turned upside down, we've got to look at the world in which Isaiah lived, listen to me, for a brief time was right side up. I want you to look with me in 2 Chronicles verse 1 of chapter 26. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. We could read he built Eloth and resorted to Judah after that the king slept with his fathers. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 2 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jeconiah of Jerusalem. And so what I want to do this morning, I want to consider about six or seven things out of Uzziah's life and bring us up to this point that we get in Isaiah chapter number 6. The first thing that I want to see with is that Uzziah begins his life, and I'm going to say this, as a precious man. Now, why do I mean precious? Well, the Bible says here in two places, we see in verse number 1 that he was 16 years old. Verse number 3, 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign. So when I say he's a precious man, I want you to think about the, 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 the potential of youth. I want us to stop and think about how much potential young people have. That's why we focus so much preaching on young people. Lord, help us this morning. We focus so much preaching on young people because there's so much potential. Now I want you to stop and think. When we think about someone like, uh, like Uzziah at 16 years old, could you imagine your life at 16 years old? I want you to stop and backtrack a little bit. Now, some of y'all, you got to backtrack a little further than the rest of us, all right? But some of y'all backtrack to 16. And I want you to think a little bit about how much potential you had at the age 16. You were probably in high school then. Some of you probably had a job then. And you're thinking about all the things in life that you wanted to accomplish. And I'm looking here ahead, and I'm seeing some young folks in our midst today we got young folks who are in their teens. We have some young folks who are in their 20s. And, you know, some folks, their, their, their lives are still way out in front of them, way out ahead. Here's a precious young man, but he's a man with potential. He begins to reign at age, number six, at age 16, and the nation of Israel is in need of a king, a godly king, a good king. Here's the interesting thing. If you go to the northern kingdom of Israel the southern kingdom of Judah, the only place we have kings who are saved and know God are in the southern kingdom. Everybody else in the northern kingdom, none of those kings are saved. None of those is saved. And so the only place that has a potential for God to move, a potential for God to do a work, is in the southern kingdom, listen to me, where they still have folks who fear God. They still have the light of God in the temple. They still have the desire to serve the Lord there. So when we look at Uzziah's life, he is a precious young man who has potential. I want you to look at verses number 4 and 5 with me this morning. And the Bible says here, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. Now this is interesting. So not only do we see a young man who is precious and has, pretend, has potential, but he's a man who seeks after the Lord. Look with me here. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Amaziah did. Look at verse number 5. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. So the first thing I want us to see, not only was Zechariah a precious man, a man with potential, he was a prepared young man. He was a prepared young man. Think about Ezra. The Bible says in Ezra chapter 7 and verse number 10, And Ezra prepared his heart to seek after the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. This man, young man we see right here is a prepared man. How is Ezra, I mean, how is Uzziah a prepared man? I want to tell you how he's prepared. He's prepared his life by seeking after God. Right. Young folks, I will remind you that your life will not be anything that it could be if you do not seek after God. Before any major life event, before attending college, before marriage, before anything that you've come up with, you always seek after God. And I want to remind you that your relationship with God is the most important relationship in the world. Right. The most important thing in your life. Before your career, before your, uh, your marriage, before having children, before, the, before a job change, everything falls under the umbrella of your relationship with God. Right. And here's a young man who did what a young man ought to do. Number one, he does what's right in the sight of the Lord. And he not only does that, but he seeks after God. He seeks after God. Why do you think that Solomon spent so much time writing to his sons? My son, give me thine heart. 
Don't go in the way of transgressors. Seek the Lord. Stay with the God of your mother and your father. Love the Lord God with all your heart. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Here's a young man who was a prepared young man. He sought after God. He sought after God. And I want to remind us that the only way that your, your life's going to be anything is seeking after God. Brother David, you and Ashley getting married here before long. Caleb, you and Miss Anna getting married before long. I want to go and tell you, the only way your life's going to be worth a hoot is going to be serving God. Going to be doing what God wants you to do. Yes. Amen. 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 That's exactly right. David, you know exactly what you want to do. Miss Ashley, you know exactly what you want to do. Brother David, you're in that job. You know what you want to do as far as the welding and doing the shop. But brother, one of these days, God may touch your heart and tell you to do something else. Brother, you need to listen to what the Lord says. Right. Amen. 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 Not everybody's a preacher, not everybody's a missionary, but I'm just going to go, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I'm telling you, God speaks to your heart. You need to be listening. And the only way to listen is by listening to the word of God. Uzziah is a precious man. He is a man with potential, but he is a prepared young man. And watch this, because, because Uzziah prepared his heart, prepared himself, I want you to look at verse number six, again, or verse number five again. It says he sought, the, sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God. Watch this. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. His prosperity that he had was because he was a prepared man. So Uzziah is a man who's precious with potential. He's a prepared young man, but now he is a prosperous man, and he prospers because he seeks God. I'm not going to tell you, that's not a coinky dink right there, friend. That, is, that, that That's one of those things that a person seeks God and their life goes right. Someone says, well, preacher, all these things happen to me. I understand that things happen. Your friends fall away. Your family falls away. There's persecution that comes. But, friend, I want to remind us that there is a prospering that happens to the child of God because he seeks God. John writes to a group of folks there in 3 John and says, I hope that thou prosperous even as thy soul prospers. God wants his people prosperous, not necessarily in the health and wealth department that you get from TDN, but he wants your soul to prosper. And God wants to bless your life. And friend, you may not be the richest person in the world. You may sit down to a bowl of cornbread and beans every night, but friend, if you got God, you've got everything that you need. You have everything that would cause you to be prosperous in this life. Amen. <clears throat> I want to remind you that wealth is not a mark of true prosperity. The vehicle that you drive, the square footage of your house is not, listen, your portfolio is not a mark of your true prosperity. Yes, Caleb, follow what Dave Ramsey says. Keep putting that $2,000 a year to that Roth IRA and maybe you might have, if we're still here and Jesus ain't come back and we're not you know, speaking Chinese, you might have $800,000 in retirement. You never know. Listen to what that, Dave's got some good stuff. I say praise the Lord. Amen. 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 But I want to remind us this morning that just because we have money in the bank and everything is great and our health looks good, that is not a sign of prosperity. The true prosperity comes because of what God has done in his word through us. So Uzziah is a prosperous young man. I want you to look at verse 20, uh, chapter 26, verse number 6. I want you to see that Uzziah, I like him. I like him. You know why I like him? Because he was a protective man. Look at verse number six. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines. Can I just go ahead and say how to live? There's some folks you ought not to never let up war with. There's some folks you can't trust them. Amen. Amen. You can't trust them. <coughs> you ought to be at war with them folks. Amen. These Philistines. Going down here a little bit, it tells us about how that he breaks down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabna, the wall of Ashdod, built cities about Ashdod, about the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians, who dwelt in, in uh, Gerbal and the Mahunims. The Ammonites gave gift to Uzziah. I just want to simply say this, that he was a protective man. And when I say that, he knew who Israel's enemies were and he did not bow to them. I'm going to tell you something. You may make peace treaties with people. 
You may remember the time that Hezekiah is there, he's feeling sick, and then people from Babylon come in to see how Hezekiah is doing. Let's just show them all the kingdom. Let's give them all of our military secrets. Let's just show him how great and prosperous we are. And it wasn't long before the Babylonians came in and took over Judea and Jerusalem. And I want to remind us that there's nothing wrong with being a protector. And this man was a protected man. He protected the nation against her old enemies. He looked out for Israel's, listen to me, her national interests and made national sovereignty a very important part of his kingly administration. That's King Uzziah. Ah, oh, but wait, there's more, there's more, there's more. Look at this. The Bible says here in verse number 8, we read part of it, and the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah. Can I just simply put it in our, in, in our terms today? He was known internationally and was respected because of his military ability and power. Man. This man was, was the one who had made a name for himself among other nations. Folks knew who he was. He was a protective man. He was a protective man, looked out for the nation. Looked out for the nation's interest. And then, you know, God's blessing him, and what happens? He makes a name for himself. Not only was he a protective man, but I will say this, he was a productive man. Look at verse number 9, if you will. He's a productive man. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, and at the valley gate, and at the turning of the wall, and fortified them. <laughs> wow, how about that? How about that? Guess what he did? He made sure that, <clears throat> the, listen to me, now Nehemiah was going to come back and build the wall. The wall was there. But if I could just use the phrase from, from modern parlance here, uh, he was fortifying a wall. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> he was fortifying a wall. Man. He was making sure that Jerusalem was protected. And if the city was protected, the physical city, that means the people were protected. So he was a man who was very productive. He was a builder. I say praise the Lord for a guy who's a builder. Amen. Look down to verse number 10. And he built towers in the desert and digged many wells. That's amazing. So not only does his military ability and his, his looking out for the nation start at Jerusalem, but he's, he's also concerned about other areas in the desert. Why are you going to build towers in the desert? Ain't nobody out there. Why are you building towers in the desert? Because, I, because I'm going to make sure that we are protected at every angle. I'm going to make sure that we are, my people and my country are protected at every end. So he's going to build towers in the desert. Not bad at all. He was a man who had some smarts, some understanding. So he's a builder. Verse number 10. By the way, he also digged many wells. You need wells for two things. You need wells for life-giving water in the event that, hey, we do go to war. Water pretty important. Without it, you, might, you, 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 you just might not make it. But look at the next part of verse number 10. And that says, for he had much cattle. And I understand the towers here, specifically in the context, more than likely for watching all the livestock that's out there. But why do you watch the livestock from towers? Remember the book of Job? Folk would come in, kill people, kill the sheep, kill the goats, the livestock. It's not just simply so, so guys can go out there and say, man, look at all these Texas longhorns. Now, they didn't have the Texas longhorns. Look at all the cattle out here. No, they're doing it because they're watching from enemies. But he digs many wells. Look at verse number 10. For he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains. Husbandmen also, farmers, if you will, and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel. For he loved husbandry. The man was a productive man. He was a builder and he was a farmer, a rancher, if you will. He was a husbandman. And here's why, why I, I, I like him, because he realized that you're only going to strengthen an economy and a nation by strengthening yourself from foreign powers and by strengthening production inside of your country. And that's what he's doing here. He's strengthening production inside the nation. And he is a husband. Can I just tell you this? I like the guy because when I look at Uzziah, here's who I see. I see a common man. I see a fellow. Look, if the man loves husbandry, if the man loves husbandry, He's more than just a fellow who goes out to his nice little British garden walking around, you know, stopping and smelling the, the roses here. He's a king who wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. I read a story one time uh, of uh, uh, Joel McRae, the Western actor. Some of y'all know who I'm talking about, the old Western actor. I'm showing my age right now, right? Well, one day the IRS showed up at his farm 
because he put on his IRS tax return that he was a farmer, a rancher, and not a movie star. And the IRS agent said, sir, you are definitely a movie star. You're not a rancher. Joe McCray just rushed out and shake hands with him and said, take a look at those hands, buddy. You don't get hands like that being a movie star. Amen. That's right. Working fellow. This king right here was a fellow who was not afraid to get his hands dirty. Not afraid to get his hands dirty. So he's a man who was a productive man. Somebody that the common man could relate to. Look at verse number 11. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men. We said earlier that he was a protective man when it came to his <clears throat> looking out for the nation and the national interest. But I will say this, he was a powerful man. Amen. He was a powerful man. He had a host of fighting men that went out to war by bands according to the number of their account by the hand of Jeiel, the scribe, and may I say the ruler, under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. One of the king's captains. So he didn't have a little bitty army that was made up of, you know, Joe, you know, Larry Mole and Curly Joe. He had an army that actually could go out and fight. One of his captains. The whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600. And so that's the chief fathers of the mighty men. Not to mention however many men he had to go out to, to, to army. Look verse 13. And under their hand was an army, 300,000. 7,500 made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. That's something else. He's a powerful man. He got 300,000 men at your disposal. That's not a bad deal for him. Not a bad deal at all. I believe you could mop a pretty good number of floors with 300,000 men. And listen to me, not only when you think about him being powerful in that sense, but how do you feed an army? How do you clothe an army? How do you equip an army? You can't do it unless you've got a strong national defense system to make sure that your army's taken care of. This man's a powerful man. Look at verse number 14 and 15. You're going to see he's a prepared man when it comes to his army. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host, shields, spears, helmets, haberjohns, bows, slings to cast on. Haberjohns just like a small shield that would go out on the front. All those things there. Slings to cast stones. Look at verse 15. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men. To be on the towers and upon the boards to shoot arrows and great stones with them. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped. Oh, he was strong. Look at this. This man's a prepared man. He ensured that his armies were prepared for battle. And watch this. <laughs> the weapons of his army weren't made by the lowest bidder. You read some of those little lists on the internet and they always tell you, you know, just remember that when you're in the heat of battle that the weapon you're carrying was made by the lowest bidder. That's really comforting, isn't it? I'm going to tell you this. Uzziah didn't farm out the lowest bidder per se to make weapons. This man is inventing engines, war machines, to protect the nation. Look at, I mean, look at verse 15. In, he made Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers upon the boards to shoot arrows and great stones. We're talking about machines that would sling arrows and catapults that would throw stones. He, was made, he made sure that he was protected. you got a wall around the city. You've got protections at the city. Any great visiting armies come up, opposing armies. We're going to make sure that we have a great show of force so that nobody comes in and tries to topple us over. I will say this. When I look at Uzziah, I like the guy. I like Uzziah. Let me, let me stop. I love Uzziah. I love the man. He starts off right with, with being a precious man, great potential. He starts off preparing his way as a young man. He becomes prosperous because God bless him. He protects his country. He's productive. He builds and he, uh, he, he, he raises livestock because he's wanting his nation to grow. And he becomes a powerful man. The armies are there. He's a prepared man. He prepares his people and prepares his army. He's prepared for battle. I'm, I'm sure if you looked at Uzziah with all the material and all the armaments around Jerusalem, they'd say, Uzziah, what are you afraid of? And he'd say, no. Right. Man. <clears throat> but I want you to look at the end of verse number 15. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Uzziah started life off with a lot of potential. 
He prepared his heart to seek after God. He protected his country. He was productive. He was a powerful man. He prepared for whatever would come down the pike. But I want us to look at verse number 16, and I want us to see that Isaiah was a prideful man. But when he was strong. Friend, the problem is whenever the strength comes, watch this, even if it comes from the Lord, and we take our eyes off of him, Who prospered Uzziah? Who helped Uzziah? Who blessed Uzziah? Is God. And we see here that in verse 5, as long as, he's, as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. But we look at verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. He was a prideful man. What led to his downfall? We can read on down here and see what happened. Just let's just look at look the rest of the story. For he transgressed, verse 16, against the Lord his God, went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore, eighty priests of the Lord that were valiant men. Now watch that. Valiant men were priests. Uh, look, look at me a minute. These weren't pushovers. These weren't little bitty fellows who couldn't, you know, uh, who were educated idiots. They were strong, they were men with backbones, and they knew it was going to take that kind of a man to stand against Uzziah because he was a man's man. Right. So it took equal priest, if you will. They withstood Uzziah the king and said to him, It appertaineth not unto the Uzziah to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Well, where in the world do you get that, buddy? We got that from God, friend. You got your call from God to watch over the nation. The priests had the call of God to burn incense and to lead the nation in worship. Mr. King, it is not for you to step into the priest's office. Right. It's not for you. Amen. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. You imagine somebody telling that to the king today? You trespassed. You judgmental person. You're a hater. You're not supposed to say such things to me. You're judgmental and you're hateful. And we just don't like your God. My God's loving and kind. He would never judge me or say anything to me like that. Because he don't exist. That's why. Amen. Right. Thou hast trespassed. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Look at verse number 19. This shows you how far Uzziah was lifted up in himself. And Uzziah was wroth. And had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth of the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And Ezra, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. Uzziah was a prideful man. He was lifted up in pride. Thought he was above everybody, anybody, could do anything that he wanted to do. Watch what Uzziah did. Uzziah suffered under the judgment of God. He was lifted up in pride. And the Bible tells us in verse number 21 that Uzziah the king was a leper to the day of his death and dwelt in a several house. A separate house. Being a leper. For he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Yeah, he was king, but somebody else, if you'll let me say it this way, took his place. <coughs> now, how long it took here from <coughs> the time that this happened and how long Jotham actually was uh, there. We don't know exactly. I mean, the next chapter tells us that he reigned uh, 16 years in Jerusalem. What a blessing that was that he reigned 16 years. Does that mean that Uzziah was in his several house for 16 years? That's not very clear. But I want you to look at something here about the pride of Uzziah and how far that it went. Look at chapter 27 and verse number 2. Speaking of Jotham, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Uzziah did. Watch this. How be it? 
He entered not into the temple of the Lord. Listen to me. Uzziah's error limited the worship of his son. Nothing wrong with going into the temple. Nothing wrong with going into the sanctuary. Nothing wrong there. There were certain places where the priest would go. Only the priest would go. But do you remember Leviticus telling us that we put our hands on top of the head of the burnt offering and the, the, the throat's cut right there next to the altar and then the blood's around the altar? You're there next to the altar while the priest is offering. But this right here tells us that he didn't even go to the house of the Lord. Why not? Because of what happened to his dad. And I want you to look at the last verse. And the people did yet what? Corruptly. His error affected the nation. The error of Uzziah affected the nation. Right. And no doubt, listen to me, the nation probably for a long time was in mourning because such a great king had come to such an abrupt and dishonorable end. Right. I will tell you, I love Uzziah. I love him. I like him because of the way he works. I like his priorities. I like that he built. I like that he liked ranching. I like all of that. But brother, when I look at Uzziah and I see his life, the backstory to Isaiah chapter number 6, I see a man who was lifted up in pride. So I want you to go with those thoughts to Isaiah chapter number 6. King Uzziah's proof, a couple things. Number one, you say, well, God... God's been opposed to him, and shortly after, if you will, he was opposed, and one long time he was deposed by God. But Uzziah's proof that God raises up kings, and he sets them down. That's God's prerogative, not mine. I want you to look in chapter 6 and verse number 1 of the book of Isaiah. It said there were two life-shaking events that happened that changed Isaiah's life forever. And those two life-changing events <clears throat> we see in chapter 6 and verse number 1. In the year, watch this, the king Uzziah died. You cannot tell me that Isaiah did not love the king. We see Isaiah's relationship with Hezekiah. Isaiah's a bold prophet. He wasn't a brash prophet. He was a bold prophet. Man. He was a prophet who wanted to be there. He wanted to be a help. He wanted to be a blessing to the men of God, the kings who were over the nation of Israel. But the two life-shaking events that took place, listen to me, was the death of King Uzziah. And in verse number 1 it says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up in his train filled the temple. The two life-changing events that happened in the same year for Isaiah the prophet were this, the king died... And then God presented a vision. If you will let me say this, the king died. But then the king of kings let me know that he was still on the throne. Amen. And I'm going to say this this morning as we've looked at Uzziah's life. We'll briefly consider Isaiah's vision. We've heard it preached on before. But I want to say, I want to, I want to understand this. Isaiah did not get his vision of God. Did not see the, the, the majesty of God until the death of the king. And friend, I want to remind us that sometimes there are kings in our lives, kings over nations, things in our lives. We're never going to see God until those things pass off the scene. Amen. And while an earthly king is important and while Uzziah did a wonderful job of making sure that the people were protected, the economy was booming, and that everything was going on, and Jerusalem had armaments, and everybody was looking out for against the opposing nations, Uzziah was a man who was prepared. He was productive. He made sure that Israel was taken care of. But brother, I want to say this, that even though Uzziah did that, there is one who rules in the heavens who watches over his people. And while an earthly king may protect an earthly people, there is a God in heaven who rules and reigns in the heavens. And he is the one who protects his people. And it makes no difference what an earthly king does. The God of heaven is the one who's in control. Amen. We never need to forget that, friend. Amen. <laughs> No matter what happens in our world, we need to remember that the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the church of the living God is the one who's in control. Right. Never forget that. 
It's not a coincidence, friend. Listen to me. It's not a coincidence that Isaiah did not see the king of kings until the earthly king passed off the scene. Right. Why is that important? How many times have we read Isaiah 6? If I were to ask for a show of hands, how many of you have heard a message out of Isaiah chapter number 6? At some point in your Christian life, every hand in this building can go up. The reason you have Isaiah chapter 6 is because King Uzziah died. The little king, little K, king, had to get out of the way so that the capital K king could be the center point of Isaiah's ministry. Five chapters. Woe, 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 woe are you, woe is you, woe is you. You all bunch of people, woe is you. You people over here, you ain't doing right. Now you know you ain't doing right. I know I'm not preaching wrong. Y'all ain't doing right. Woe are you, woe is you, and woe are you right there. But then Isaiah gets a hold of, gets a hold of, of this vision, and the vision actually gets a hold of him. And then Isaiah says this, woe is me. <coughs> In verse Excuse me, one through four, we see the holy presence of God. I'm not going to dwell on this because I simply just want to read the verses and move on. The train of God fills the temple in verse six, verse two, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Twenty covered his face, with twenty covered his feet, with twenty did fly. One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved to the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. You have a picture of the holiness of God. The reason the house is filled with smoke is because of the infinite fire of God. I mean, Paul tells us in, in Hebrews that our God is a consuming fire. Where there's fire, friend, there's going to be the remnants of that, the telltale signs of that. We also have the altar that is burning there in verse number six, and we have that. We see Isaiah's awful realization, verse 5, and he said, Woe is me, for I'm undone. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Now, why did he say that? For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. <coughs> we see that awful realization. We see the fiery cleansing, verses 6 and 7, one of the seraphims having a live coal in his hands. Boy, <laughs> look at there which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. I laid it on my mouth and said, Lord, this has touched thy lips, thy iniquity is taken away, thy sin purged. We have the cleansing of Isaiah. And watch this in verse number 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. We have the call of God come. The commission to Isaiah is coming forward to say, Yes, I'll go. It took the death of the beloved leader of the nation for Isaiah to see God. Watch this. And then Isaiah <coughs> to be sent, listen to me, to the same people the king once used to rule over. It took the death of the king for Isaiah to see God. May I say this, when the king died, Isaiah went from an earthly perspective in our text here to an eternal heavenly perspective that there was a work yet needed to be done in that country that was so greatly blessed by his eyes. Uh, rule. But it took the death of the king to see that. It took the death of the, listen to me, once listen to me very carefully, it took the death of the beloved leader of the nation for Isaiah to focus on the call of God for his life. And it took the death of that beloved leader of the nation for Isaiah to see that there were other people he needed to be sent to. Folks, it ain't, it ain't about our four no more. It's not about the four church walls and everybody who's in here. There is a world of people outside. We live in a sinful world. Um, I get a notification on my phone that said, you know, shots fired at, you know, Minhoffer 21st. And somebody puts a little text on, under, under that notification and said, when are shots not fired in that area? That's, that, that's where we live. 
when those are the kind of comments that are made on that in that part of town. Yeah. On the way here to church today, got another notification that up on Shaylin there were a couple of hotels that were robbed at gunpoint. And thankfully the robbers traveled west. They traveled east and stopped in here. It would have been a bad day in America for them. Yeah, yes, oh yes, friend. But why is it that people make comments when shots not fired in that area? Why is that area known for being, you know, ridden with crime? Why is that? It's because there are people in that area who need to come face to face with God, with God Almighty. Amen. And, and I don't want you to take wrong what I'm about to say. Please don't take wrong what I'm about to say. But when we tell everybody that God loves everybody unconditionally, People get the idea that, oh, man, that means I can do whatever I want. Hey, everything's great and hunky door. Well, tell you what, God loves your soul. But you disobey God, you blow smoke in God's face, and you go do your own thing, and you die without God, God will put you in hell quicker, and you can, you can shake a stick in that. Just man. Don't get me wrong. I do believe John 3.16. But we've had so much of this, <clears throat> so much of this preached where God loves and Loves everybody, loves everybody, loves everybody that we've almost done away with the idea of sin, judgment, and hell. We've almost done away with the idea that our God is a what? A consuming fire. Right. I love fire in the cold winter. I'd love to have a wood stove. I think it's the best way to heat a house, praise God. I love it. <clears throat> but brother, I might be cold, but I'm not jumping into the wood stove to get warm. I'm not going to roll around in the fire to make sure that I don't get frostbite, friend. I understand there's going to be a healthy spirit, health, a healthy distance away from the fire because the fire, the same fire that warms is the same fire that kills. The same fire that can give life is the same fire that can take away life. And friend, we've got to understand that there is a God in heaven and those folks who will not bow to him will stand in judgment and will be screaming as they're tossed into the charred walls of a burning hell never to get out. And friend, the only way Isaiah saw that, he saw that when King Uzziah died. Now, it may not have been immediately. He just said in the year that he died. It could have been several months after. We have no idea how long that was. But what we do know is that the two life-shaking events that happened in Isaiah's life was the death of a beloved king. And his vision of the Lord that caused him to refocus his priorities and put him where God wanted him in the ministry. Amen. So, friend, I just want to leave, it with, leave us with that this morning. Isaiah had a life changing moment. And you and I are never going to have any kind of life changing moments until something happens in our lives and gets us focused on God. Help us to learn from Isaiah. Let's all stay in our feet this morning. <coughs> our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the grace of God that bringeth salvation that hath appeared to all men. Lord, we're grateful for the goodness of God and the mercy of God that's led us to repentance for all that you've done for us. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to get our eyes and hearts focused on you in these days. Lord, as we've looked at Isaiah and we see what's transpired in his life and how that Lord, such a great, great need took place in his life after the king had died. And Lord, you were gracious to visit him. And as it were, almost recommissioned him in a sense, Lord, anew and afresh to preach to just a small remnant of people. Lord, I pray that as that call would go out today, who will go for us and whom shall I send? That there will be folks this morning who would raise the hands of their hearts and say this, Lord, hear my, send me. I pray you'd be glorified in all things today. I pray that you'd help us this afternoon, Lord, as we uh, eat dinner, as we fellowship, and Lord, as we look over things for tonight, you'd bless the young ladies' class, you'd bless the uh, prayer room tonight, that you'd bless our service this evening. God, you'd be glorified in all things. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. Lord, for all you do, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.